Uh, hi, everyone. Um, can everyone hear us? Show of hands. Hey, <laughs> hello. Um, we're really excited to be here today. Well, virtually here, we're not actually there. Um, and take you behind the scenes of Sustainably, which is an Edinburgh-based uh, fintech startup. There are two of the team here today. There's Aishal Quinn, who is our kick-ass co-founder and chief product officer. And then there's myself, um, I'm Jenny Bjortman, and I am the UX lead. So it's my responsibility to make sure our sustainable users have the best experience possible. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I spent 17 years in financial services in various roles, such as information design, marketing, and project management. Uh, including Agile, Waterfall and Six Sigma before chucking it all in uh, and doing a professional diploma in UX design and then joining Sustainably. So big corporate to start up, bit of a change. Uh, firstly, if you don't know who Sustainably are, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Uh, we like to say that we are a simpler way of giving. Um, essentially, we connect people with the causes they love, kind of like Netflix, but for social good. And our main product is Roundups, which is great because it allows you to change the world every time you shop. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You just set and forget and it automatically rounds up your day-to-day -day purchases and uses a spare change to make micro donations to the charity of your choice. Um, it's made possible by the exciting new world of open banking, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Um, and because we're dealing with sensitive information, we are really, really big on uh, security and privacy. We built the, the app from the ground up with bank level security and total privacy. Uh, it was externally verified and they were really impressed. Uh, we do not pass your details on to the causes. It's your tool to engage with causes and not the other way around. So you can see your impact, but all your donations are anonymous. We've won quite a few awards so far. At the end of 2019, Richard Branson named us Start of the Year. So we're still kind of pinching ourselves about that one. Uh, but today, what we really want to talk to you about is how to create an awesome product. Well, more specifically, how to create an awesome product with no time, no people and no money. And then how do you keep doing that? And I think what we can all agree have been very challenging times. So on the run up to launch, uh, we had a very small team, uh, mostly working part time and a tiny budget. But we're determined to, to create delight and try and include positivity, optimism and charm in the product. The thinking was that it was an opportunity to make someone smile, then why not take it? And these are all things that require thought and care to pull off, but it doesn't add any technical complexity and very little production costs. Um, so for us, it was a no brainer. As an example, um, here's our service unavailable page. Now, we could have just said that, but uh, this is much nicer. So to get our brand across consistently, we needed a simple but effective visual identity. Uh, for Imagery, as much as we all love great photography and kick-ass videos, they cost a lot of money to produce, and that was money that we just didn't have. So instead, we created a small pool of custom illustration-based assets, and the big benefits of this are, uh, one, it gives us something we can visually own. Two, they can be easily repurposed for a wide range of uses. And three, most importantly, they were really inexpensive to make. So once we had our creative direction set, we still needed a copious amount of screen states and variations drawn up. Um, because we knew that we'd need all of these screens done at pace, the first thing we did was to put together a design system. And it included all our common brand assets, colours, type and UI patterns. And that's kind of like Lego bricks. So being able to use UI patterns and sticker sheets to assemble the final screens has quite a few benefits. Firstly, it makes everything uh, more consistent. So type styles, common elements, margins and icons are all preset. Uh, secondly, it allows us to take shortcuts, which is essential when you have limited time to get changes turned around. Um, when doing the UX, I can really quickly chuck together a journey in high fidelity and it's still as quick to edit and tweak as doing rough wireframes. And then when we feel like we've nailed it, the final UI designs are all already 75% up. And thirdly, most people, due to no fault of their own, 
tend to take what's in front of them as face value. And this means that when you're showing people low fidelity designs, one of two things happens. They either withhold their feedback until they think the designs look more finalized and that leads to lots of post sign off design changes, or they give super detailed feedback, even on things that are obviously not done yet, and that causes loads of extra admin. So the closer you can get your designs and prototypes to the finished thing, the better and more relevant your feedback will be. Um, and if you don't have the UI expertise on your product to develop a design system, just use one that already exists. So Google Material Design is great and it's free to use. So now you have your super high fidelity designs created at breakneck speed. Uh, they have to be handed over to your developers. Um, we upload all our design files into a tool called Zeppelin, which then produces a full spec, as well as optimized image assets for front end development. Um, and this automated workflow shaves days off every design iteration, which all adds up. Uh, we're going to move on now to talk about user testing. Um, but before we do, I, what I really want you to think about in your projects, large or small, is where are your opportunities to deliver delight and reaffirm your product's brand values? Um, and which UI patterns will you need? Could you benefit from putting these into your toolbox early? All of this will help you create not an MVP, if you haven't heard the term, um, that's a minimum viable product, but an MLP, which is a minimum lovable product. But by far, the main thing that will help you create a minimum lovable product is talking to your users. But that takes time and again, costs money. So how did we do that on the startup budget? So firstly, I'll give you a bit of background into why it's so essential for us in particular to talk to our customers. Um, creating a product that's the first of its kind is, <laughs> while really exciting, also gives you a heap of obstacles to overcome. Um, our main one was the fact that we are a really unusual case for open banking, and that's one that our users have never come across before. Open banking, if you don't know what open banking is, it's a government initiative that gives you ownership of the financial data held by you, uh, held on you by your bank. And it allows companies like us to create really innovative and useful financial products designed with you in mind. Catch, well, open banking is fantastic, or at least we think so. Uh, one tiny catch, you have to hand over your online banking details, but well, you don't really, but that's what it looks like. And that's something all the banks are spending millions of pounds every year telling us not to do. So I think we can all agree connecting things to your bank isn't normal. Um, and in terms of user onboarding, that is like a Ben Nevis size speed bump. And th this is actually a photograph of a mountain called Bupaleta. Uh, it turns out Ben Nevis, uh, although really famous, isn't actually that impressive in photos and just kind of looks like a big hill. Uh, and not everyone's heard of Bupaleta, so you can forgive my artistic license. Uh, so we needed to help our users scale this enormous speed bump, and we needed to talk to them to discover how we were going to do that. And because we had no money, uh, we chose usability testing, as that would give us um, the biggest bang for a buck. But what were our options? Um, well, big platforms were one, but uh, so you get things like usertesting.com, but they, they are now um, all subscription based and eye-wateringly expensive. Um, we had an agency that were interested in helping us, but that ended up being way out of our price range as well, even with the discount. Uh, the quote came back and we were like, oops. So we had to just run the tests ourselves. So how did we go about doing usability testing when we had no time and no money? Well, we had to get really organised. Um, there are various techniques we could have used at this stage, but we decided to combine depth interviews with usability testing to get the most out of time that we had with each participant. Uh, first, we wrote interview scripts with warm up questions and depth interviews, and then we gave them um, a series of tasks. So the warm up questions are really just to get them talking, and it's, it's stuff that you don't need the answer to. It's like, where do you live? What do you do for a living? That kind of thing. Um, depth interviews go into a lot more detail and really explore their goals. Uh, we asked them questions about their, their use of financial products online and how they like to give to charity. Uh, the trick here is to ask them about what they've done in the past. Um, asking them about what they'll do in the future is completely pointless, as people have a very skewed view of what they'll do in the future. Just think about the last time you said, I'll not have that glass of wine tonight and I'm going to the gym tomorrow. 
So for the tasks, we got users to complete our registration process. Um, we asked them to register at the Sustainably for Roundups, which is our main product. Watching users try to complete a task using your site is illuminating, to say the least. Uh, running usability tests with four users will drive out most of your major issues, but even testing with one user is better than none at all. Um, and to find people willing to do tests, we utilised all of our existing networks, including friends and family, previous work colleagues, and companies we were in partnership with, like Edinburgh University. So, we managed to do all of that on a tiny budget. As you can see, it costs us around 375 quid, but you could do it for nothing. Um, if anyone is interested in how we did it, just get in touch and, and I'll be happy to walk through it. So everyone knows what happened in March last year. Uh, COVID hit and literally the entire world went online. This made usability testing in person um, impossible. So we had to rethink how we ran tests as we didn't want to stop improving the app or worse, start guessing and making assumptions like no. So once again, testing online would have been a lot easier if we had an unlimited budget and we could afford a subscription to one of the big testing platforms, but we just couldn't. So we had to get our hacky hats on. Heisel and I are like the hacky twins. Um, and we had to think about how we could create a professional testing environment and get quality results on a very limited budget. So the good news is that doing testing online doesn't cost a fortune either. So on to the tools. Um, after much trial and error, the tools we now use are Zoom, uh, Otter.ai and Marvel. So we've run a number of tests now using this combination and the, re the results that you get are really professional. Um, Zoom has obviously become a household name in the last year. Uh, we lived on Zoom as a team um, anyway because we spent so much time in different locations. But at least we saw each other sometimes. Uh, but now Zoom is the norm and free if you keep your sessions under 40 minutes. You can run depth interviews or usability tests on Zoom and record the session while you're doing it. If you haven't noticed it, there's a record button uh, at the bottom of the screen. If you're recording, once you close the Zoom session, Zoom sends a file to your computer and very helpfully puts it in a folder called Zoom. Um, and in that folder, there'll be three files, one of which is an MP3 audio, and this is where otter.ai comes in. So otter.ai is a web app and super easy to use. Uh, all you have to do is drag an audio or a video file in and it will translate it for you. Uh, then you can export it as a text file for analysis later, literally saving hours and hours of work typing up notes. Doesn't always translate uh, things perfectly and you, you will come across some crackers, um, but uh, it gets most of it and it saves you lots, lots of time. Uh, and the best bit is it's only eight quid a month for pretty much unlimited transcripts. Uh, there is a free version though, and if your budget is super tight, it just limits the amount you can transcribe. Uh, so Marvel, um, that combination is great for interviews, the author.ai and Zoom, uh, but for user ability testing, where you actually want to see someone using a prototype, then Marvel is the perfect addition. Um, and also really, really easy to use. You just drag images in and then stitch them together in a clickable prototype with hotspot. To use it in testing, you just send your participant a link to the prototype and then get them to share your screen, uh, share their screen with you and then you record the session. And just remember to get their permission to record. Uh, Marple is also only eight quid a month. Um, there is a free version, but it only allows you to have one prototype at a time. But for really tight budgets, you can just delete the last prototype you did before you create a new one. So I understand that that was a lot of information that I just chucked at you, um, and I'm sure my accent will not help. Uh, so again, if you have any questions about any of it, don't hesitate to hunt me down on social and uh, I'll be happy to help. Uh, and next up, we have our amazing product owner, Aisha Quinn, um, and our co-founder, who is the glue that holds this whole team together. Hi, everyone. So excited to be here today. And thanks, Jen. So, um, wow, we've been on a long journey. We started sustainably when it was just an idea and pretty much just a lot of post-it notes. Um, <laughs> our challenge, could we design a tech product that would be completely sustainable and allow everyone to have a positive impact every day? So it's been a long road designing a proof of concept first, then building our incredible team to get us a product to market from scratch. 
you know, we started from zero and then within five months we had launched. So it was a crazy whirlwind of, you know, things going on. Um, we've since then we've adapted an agile framework to create a delivery approach that works for our team. Um, it's not perfect and it's constantly changing, um, but we're able to deliver frequently and iteratively improve on our product based on customer feedback. So today I'm going to share our learnings related to delivery and mindset, which hopefully you should find useful to maximize your time, to get the most from your team and to stretch your budget. So. Jenny has emphasized the importance of user testing and gathering feedback from real people to ensure the adoption of your product. And I really like this picture from uh, Leonardo Pinter um, highlighting the importance of ensuring that um, what you build solves real human problems. So if someone makes you know, if you're building a product that's making someone's life better, easier, more convenient, then your product will always be relevant. And this concept, this hypothesis testing um, and experimentation is core to everything we do at Sustainably. So we talk to our customers, understand their problems, identify how we can solve them, and then we take our assumptions and ideas and turn them into hypotheses, which we can then test. So, for example, um, we know that uh, our customers find it difficult to choose a charity. So um, if there's too many charities to choose from, it can be overwhelming. Um, so we know this from both talking to people about their own experiences of charitable giving, and we can also see it from our own product data. So our hypothesis is that if we can personalize the process of choosing a charity by finding out what interests them, then we can help guide them to a relevant charity that they will care about. So we've reduced the cognitive load on our customers by doing this. And this concept of testing and experimentation is core to everything that we're doing. Um, the key thing is that we don't want to spend a lot of time designing and building a feature until we prove that there is an audience and that we're really understanding their problem. So what Jenny does is she rapidly creates wireframes and prototype that we then uh, use uh, to test with people and we're constantly iterating that based on feedback that we get and then pushing that into delivery. So we can do this cycle of interviewing uh, ideation. Sorry, that's my dogs barking. That's probably going to happen multiple times. <laughs> um, so we can do this process of interviewing uh, ideation, validation, um, you know, validating the hypothesis and then design and test in three weeks end to end. And this will run with a variety of other experiments that we're running in parallel. Uh, so it's, it's really great that we've managed to get that process down pat. OK, so we build features which align to our product strategy. Um, so fact, you will find yourself saying no more than yes, and that is OK. There's always going to be more work than you have available time within your team, no matter how big or small your organization. So we use uh, a dual track agile approach with our product team. So it's split between discovery team and delivery team. So the discovery team is focused on talking to customers, creating hypotheses, uh, verifying them and determining uh, the detail required to take that into delivery. And then the delivery team is focused on delivering features into the app. So uh, any feature that's built needs to align to our product strategy. So in order to determine what features will be delivered into the app, we use an objective rating for each feature, um, which, combine, which basically combines three factors. So impact, how much impact will this feature um, have? Confidence, uh, how much evidence we have that this feature is required, and effort, how much effort is it going to take for us to deliver this? So the key to effective prioritization is to remove the individual opinion from prioritization. And I know that sounds really 
easy to say, but you do find that you do have to have a certain level of discipline to not um, let yourself slip back into that pattern of opinion. Um, so a great place to start is identifying the confidence level. Um, and you'll see this little wheel here that we always use um, to identify that. So um, by identifying that confidence level that people actually want the feature, it really helps. And this is done by gathering data to verify that the feature will solve a problem. And then you can see, you know, how much data you have, how much evidence you have, um, and where do you sit on that confidence level. Um, OK, so every feature we build in the app has a metric that is used to determine its success and it needs to be able to be measured. So choosing the right metric to prove um, that we have influenced our customer behavior is really important. Um, and to be specific, e.g., you know, a click through rate on a new feature, uh, uh, increased in donations, time spent viewing a certain screen. So every feature's success is measured against a specific hypothesis. So um, regardless of all the planning, life happens and you should expect the unexpected. We are still a small team um, and still not all of us are full time. Um, and our product is also integrated with a number of third party applications such as payments providers and as Jen mentioned, open banking. So we need to work out how to best manage our customer issues, bugs and somehow fit in delivery of new features. We don't have the luxury of sending bugs to other support team. I wish we did. Um, so to manage our unplanned work and planned work within one team, we kind of have to do a bit of a juggling act. So um, we we don't always go back to the value but basically we always go back to the value based decisions. Sorry. So the concept to decide what the highest priority um, activity is. Um, and we've introduced an unplanned work stream into our um, sprint planning in JIRA. So this is an online tool to manage the work to be done. So as time goes on, basically the degree of unplanned work for us has reduced significantly. So post go live, we were about 60% unplanned work and now the split is more like 10%. Um, so it really is, you know, using that ice metric to really get better at how much effort you think things are going to be and to try and get more realistic with your planning. Um, this this highlights um, that software development is not a linear process, even with the best attempts to estimate, there's always unknowns. So often when engineers get into a complex area like payments um, or bank transactions, um, it becomes clear that new work is required to complete the sprint goal. So the impact is often we don't achieve it all. Um, you know, we don't achieve what we said we were going to do as a sprint goal. Um, but we believe that if our engineers explain that the new unplanned tasks saved us time or money in the future, then there's always a high enough value to take on tasks um now and we accept that into the sprint and we agree that what moves out uh was a result so we've covered some ideas on making decisions and prioritization um to get the most maximum value um but what about mindset so our attitude to delivery how can we use our mindset to get the most out of any situation so delivery is hard um, I think that's something we can pretty much all agree on. Um, however, our mindset really determines how we can achieve the outcome. So one of our team members' daughters asked her how it was going at work. Um, and she replied that, you know, she was really struggling to get this app store review in. Um, so her daughter went away and she came back a couple minutes later and presented her with this drawing, which I think is, is really, really cute. And it kind of explains what they call the learning pit and the concept of this growth mindset. So when you start to do something new, it's always going to get hard and it's going to be worse before it gets better. And that process of learning um, 
is challenging but when you get to a turning point where you start to kind of come out of the other end of the learning pit that's when it gets easier and her daughters basically advised her that you can't say that you can't do it you must always say I can't do it yet um which is a life lesson from a very wise 11 year old um who is adorable sorry that's my dogs continually barking at a squirrel for no reason um so that's pretty much our mantra in the team that we're always learning always you know stretching to achieve um always improving bit by bit to get to the other side of the learning pit um and uh, continuing on the theme of mindset, um, I want you to kind of take yourself back to a time when you failed at something and, you know, that feeling sucks. Um, it can feel really painful. Um, an example of this for me, when I was in school, particularly high school, I didn't do so well. I had dyspraxia, dyslexia. I hated it because I was failing all the time, failing all the tests failing, failing, failing. Um, but since then, you know, I've learned a lot about myself and my skill sets. Um, starting your own um, fintech will do that as well and um, really draw it out. So I started my own tech company and since then it's meant that I've had to really kind of absorb this growth mindset and this will figure it out attitude. So with a heck of a lot of resilience and willing to learn and grow, um, I've managed to come out the other end of the learning pit a few times, but I'm, you know, m willing to go through any time and do so multiple times a day. So in product delivery, sometimes uh, goals aren't achieved, but I think it's so important to remember to not just focus on the sprint goals um, and whether or not they're achieved or not. You know, that is important, but actually enjoy the process of getting there um, and also focus on what you learn along the way um, and take that into the next sprint and continue to improve. So my last thought um, about making the most of your time, money and your team is to focus on the health of, of your team. So it's the most important thing um, that, that it's more important than the health of your product, basically. So looking after our team has become even more to the forefront um, of what we do since COVID. Um, I think everyone can relate to that. It's changed pretty much everyone's life. Um, and if you have no team, you have no product. So uh, when you have a high performing, really committed team who push themselves to deliver constantly and solve complex problems, which we're doing every day, um, and problems that are kind of crucial to creating an environment that you feel people are being stretched, but not too stretched. Um, that's really the, the kind of place that we're trying to attain in our team. So the types of things that create stress, which we've found, are false deadlines, um, constantly kind of doing context hopping and not feeling like people are able to fully complete one task before starting another. Um, and I'm sure that everyone's kind of experienced that at some point or another. So uh, one of the things we do is we take retros very seriously. So at the end of each sprint, we do a retro um, where we kind of review how the sprint went and what we can do to improve um, and ensuring we talk about the these things, you know, and what's the most important to the team um, are really important. So, uh, you know, we're not trying to make it directly related to the actual delivery of the product. It's fully kind of holistic. So it's good to have an open discussion um, as a company or within your individual teams um, about, you know, what you can do more to help each other um, throughout COVID, how you can help kind of ease the working load. Um, and it's important to spot fatigue as well and stress by really kind of listening to each other um, and observing body language. So it tends to be relatively easy um, to put a bit of balance back into working life. Um, it can feel 
like it's not possible but there are little things you can do to try and weave it in um and we're trying different ideas all the time to try and break up the working week you know particularly because we're all working from home uh one of the latest concepts we've introduced is fika which is a, a swedish concept and so for an hour every wednesday we get together as a company and it's on an open video call um you can come along it's not mandatory bring coffee tea some treats um, and we pretty much just have a chat about anything um not non-work related and the key point of this is that the health of your team is so critical um, to you know the long-term success of your company and so we've realized that people work shorter days because the day is more intense there's no time for like nipping out to lunch or going to grab something or you know speaking to people in the office so really your day is solid head down working um, and, you know, I'm incredibly proud of the team we've managed to build at Sustainably. It feels really rewarding to work with a bunch of really talented people, not to get too cheesy, <laughs> but we're all kind of working together on a clear vision and with purpose. And, you know, I hope that some of these ideas about maximizing your time and your money and getting the most of your teamwork have been useful today. Um, it's been really great talking to you. I feel like we've kind of just been talking at you because we're not there in person um, about some of the experiences and challenges we've had. And I hope that perhaps um, you can relate to some of them. Um, if you haven't checked us out already, um, then please do so. You can download the Sustainably app for free. We're in the App Store and Google Play. Um, and if you do, please let us know how you get on and, and tell us about your experience we'd love to hear what you think so we can keep making sustainably even more awesome thanks everyone now the slides have gone uh first of all should we start a round of applause uh, hello i have to go to the microphone apparently sorry Rosie's told me off. OK, so we have some questions. I'll read the questions off Slack one at a time. Um, you guys can fight over who answers. OK, so the first question, and then I'll ask the crowd for more. So first of all, how do you encourage collaboration with your teams, even with remote working? <laughs> um, I'll take this one. So we're actually started using Miro. Um, we use Miro pretty much religiously every day um, where we have open board set up where people can go and see different things. Um, we also use it during meetings as a collaboration tool. It's basically like a virtual whiteboard, but it also has things like voting. You can actually now put like music on it. So if we're kind of writing down retros of things, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, we put a timer on it and then we put some kind of relaxation um, elevator music on in the background but there's loads of tools that you can use on Miro as collaborative um, ways of kind of doing things so we we tend to get together um, every morning at 9 30 to do our kind of catch up um, as to what we're all doing that day and because we are still a small team I guess it is maybe a bit easier than when we start to grow and expand and we have lots of different teams um, kind of all around the place. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question, um, maybe Jenny to this one. How have you maintained momentum and motivation when adapting and reacting to COVID? Um, I think, as Aisha said, um, we we have a really strong shared vision at Sustainably. And I think um, it was quite obvious from the first lockdown that charities really needed us because all their uh, work, had, all their fundraising events had, had completely shut down. So, um, and everyone that works at Sustainably um, is completely uh, immersed in vision. So, so that, that kind of does keep us going when, when it's hard, because it is hard. Yeah. And start with hard, because, you know, it's, it's hand to mouth a lot of the time. So you, you need people who, who, can, uh, who can work in that environment. Um, but yeah, as I also said, we, we do things like Pika and, you know, we tr we've tried to do a few catch ups in person. So there's been things in parks, social distance, obviously. Um, and yeah, just just keeping an eye on people and just making sure that that everyone's OK and that that um, 
sustainably fits around their lives. So we've got some people who are night owls who kind of do stuff at night, and then we've got Isle and I who are up at like, <laughs> like stupid o'clock in the morning, and, and everyone just has just kind of worked around their own their own schedules, and that that's kept everyone motivated through this pretty awful time, really. And the last question we have, then I'll go to the crowd. Um, do you have any recommended further reading? <laughs> Jen has a full library and usually what because I'm dyslexic like I'll read it on the audio I'll, like I'll listen to it on the audiobook or I'll just get Jen to give me a summary at the end of it so <laughs> that's the best version of any book is Jen's summary. I, I would be where do I start? Uh, what am I reading at the moment? I'm reading uh, Sense and Respond which is uh, Jeff Gothel and uh, Josh Seiden. Yeah, and that, that's brilliant. That's really good. So that's talking about uh, how you can get this two way conversation going with your customers and how you should uh, prioritize learning over delivery. So um, so that's what that's what we're on this week. <laughs> Put some yeah. links to that into the Slack channel. That would be really helpful. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I will do. But I've got a lot. Any more questions for the crowd like before these folks go? Yeah, Inspired as well was another one we were oh, reading. Was an, the Marty Keegan one. That was a, a good one. Yeah, user story mapping. I've got a whole, I've got a whole bunch. <laughs> um, I think I'll just finish up then by saying thank you. And if you didn't know, this was the first time ever we've had co-presenters in a remote talk. Wow. It's, <laughs> I did have we're a here, nice but it's great to see some of you if we can't have all of you. Yeah, I had a nice background like Jen as well, but technical difficulties. So. Yeah. <laughs> you both, and thanks again from everyone here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.